two weeks after he climbed onto the stage to declare himself the leader, Mohammed Mohsen Ali Al Zabaidi holds court in the top floor of a downtown hotel. The self-appointed mayor of Baghdad is promising to pay the salaries of tens of thousands of workers with money from what he calls the central bank. Mohammed Ali Zabaidi returned from exile with the Iraqi National Congress just after U.S. troops toppled Saddam Hussein. He rallied civil servants. He claimed the smiles and support of so-called prominent tribal and family members. But his political tactics have raised serious questions, not least with Baghdad's acting chief of police. He says Zubaydi's representatives offered him the equivalent of a million dollars in Iraqi currency to pay the salaries of 30,000 officers and expenses. Yes, of course, and I would be expected to dispute it to the other officers, but we refused because Zubaydi is not an official representative. Baghdad police chief General Zuhair says you offered him around a million dollars in Iraqi dinars at 7.30 p.m. on Saturday night in his office. No, 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 no. And he added in Arabic, there's no such thing as that. And please, check with your sources. We did check with our sources in the very office where both the police chief, General Niami Zuhair, and his deputy confirmed they were offered the salaries and expenses. As we spoke, two men identifying themselves as Zubaydi's representatives entered the chief's office and presented a written request from the self-declared mayor for police squad cars. One of the representatives, who identified himself as Ishmael Kallis, not only confirmed the police chief's account of the estimated million-dollar offer on April 19th, he repeated it. Mr. Zabaidi says the salaries are available, he said. Back in the self-declared mayor's penthouse, confronted with those statements from three witnesses, including his own man, Zubaidi again denied making any offer and denied knowing anyone named Ishmael Kallis. I didn't send any delegates, nor have I sent any person. And you can ask General Zuhair to clarify this. I have not sent anybody, and I did not offer money. Confront me with these people, or tell me their names. What, Ismail? No one called Ismail works for us. But when told CNN had videotape of his representatives handing over his requests for squad cars, Zobaidi admitted that, yes, he did know the men we named. Clearly agitated, the self-declared mayor stressed he hadn't tried to do anything wrong. I have sent no one, and I confirm this to you through CNN. We are not a gang. We are not a gang. We are an administration. Zobaidi's administration promised tens of thousands of struggling Iraqis exactly what they want to hear. A paycheck is on the way. The question is where was he to get the money? The answer was right here at the Palestine Hotel. The president and general manager of the Rafadin Bank told CNN that during the looting, he parked an armored van containing $262 million here for safekeeping. Both the bank manager and the Iraqi National Congress say Mr. Zabaidi wanted to use that cash to pay the millions he promised, effectively ensuring his own political fortunes. But the bank, with the help of the U.S. military and the INC, moved the cash to a guarded bank vault, while Zubaidi's men tried in vain to stop them. Now, without the money or the support of the INC, many are predicting Mohammed Zabaidi's short political career as mayor of Baghdad is about to come to an end. Jim Clancy, CNN, Baghdad. On the playing card list of 55 most wanted Iraqis, the head of military intelligence has been caught. He said he had nothing to apologize for and hoped to spend his remaining days as a civilian. Also arrested were the head of Iraq's air defenses and the trade minister. A senior intelligence officer not on the list was also caught. ...dish areas than here in the capital. All the same, he was brimming with confidence when he sat down this afternoon with his British deputy to answer questions at what was formerly Saddam Hussein's biggest conference centre. General Ghana arrived after a meeting with what he described as community leaders. 
and having told them his interim administration will soon be up and running. We wanted to reopen the ministries next week. And so we have a coordinator for every ministry. Now, that coordinator ain't going to run it. The Iraqis are going to run the ministries. But we, wanted, we told them if they could get the people together, if there's no longer a ministry, we'll find a facility. If they still have a ministry, there's no furniture, we'll go buy the furniture. We'll get the computers. We'll start all that government. It's very important that the people start back to work, especially the people in public service. He said the coordinators will be international figures working with Iraqis who will be vetted for links to the old regime. And he sees the hand of Tehran behind Shia Muslim protests calling for Islamic rule and a quick American departure. Those are well organized if you look at them. And I think what you find in that is a lot of Iranian influence. Uh, I certainly don't think that represents anywhere near the majority. I think the majority is very silent, the majority is being very safe, the majority is still uh, somewhat uh, afraid, and I think as you see them beginning to get more comfortable, you'll see more, uh, uh, more favoritism toward the U.S. As for the political future, he denied that Ahmed Chalabi, the head of the opposition Iraqi National Congress, is Washington's favorite. Now, Mr. Shah, I know Mr. Shalabi is a fine man. He's not my candidate. He's not the candidate of the coalition. There are several leaders, and I think all the, you'll see the leaders merge within the next week or so, and they will begin to work with us, and we'll work together on providing the proper frameworks. But that's not the way it looks on the streets, where Mr. Chalabi's U.S.-trained militia is increasingly in evidence, guarding ministries and at checkpoints working with the Americans. It's also the INC that's persuaded a number of members of the old regime to give themselves up. Overnight, American forces, without INC help, arrested three more of the 55 most wanted Iraqi leaders from the old regime. Among them was Muzahim Saab Hassan al takriti the commander of Iraq's air defenses and the highest ranking prisoner yet. Also captured was General Zuhaya Talib Abid al-Sattar al-Nakib, Saddam's chief of military intelligence, and the trade minister, Muhammad Mahdi al-Sali. These bring to 11 the number of Saddam's inner circle now in custody. While the latest military arrests may cast light on why Iraq's armed forces in the end clapped so quickly and completely, Information from the trade minister will also be highly prized. It was from this now wrecked office that he approved deals with foreign companies. Not only might he cast new light on sanctions busters, but it's widely believed that legal trade deals were steered towards France and Russia, even when more expensive, in order to buy their political support. The coalition will be looking for justification to renege on old deals and keep Moscow and Paris out of new contracts for reconstructing Iraq. Well, you saw the state of the trade ministry there. It's been pretty well looted and burnt. And with the exception of the oil ministry, most other government departments are in a pretty bad way. And that's left civil servants here wondering exactly how they're going to heed General Garner's call to return to the office. How he turned himself in? Hi, Stan. Not exactly uh, details as to how he turned himself in, but we have learned a few things over the last couple of hours. And that is that, first of all, yesterday, uh, this would be Wednesday, uh, in Baghdad, representatives of Tariq Aziz approached U.S. coalition officials there about the possibility of Tariq Aziz turning himself in. U.S. officials told uh, CNN's David Ensor uh, that the response was, we don't make any deals. Uh, however, we are aware that negotiations did take place for some time uh, over the last 24 hours and that earlier today, Thursday, Tariq Aziz did turn himself in to U.S. authorities in Baghdad. Tariq Aziz, of course, a senior member of the Saddam Hussein regime, longtime member of the inner circle. Although he has not been at the, uh, the front uh, for the last several months, certainly uh, for many years the public face and voice of the regime of Saddam Hussein, uh, well known uh, to people throughout the world and in the United States, probably uh, known uh, better than any uh, Iraqi official other than Saddam Hussein himself. Uh, Tarek Aziz uh, most recently was the 
uh, deputy uh, prime minister. He had previously been the foreign minister, held a number of uh, very senior posts, was considered to be a, uh, for a long time, a, a, a member of the uh, inner circle of Saddam Hussein. And it's hoped, at least by U.S. intelligence officials and the U.S. military, that uh, he will be able to be instrumental in advancing some of the efforts that are ongoing in, uh, in Iraq, uh, not the least of which is trying to lo locate stockpiles of chemical and biological weapons, elements of the uh, Iraqi uh, nuclear program. Uh, it's not known whether he will actually be able to provide first-hand information regarding these weapons of mass destruction programs, but it is hoped that he will at least uh, be able to provide information on the whereabouts of some other senior officials uh, still missing. Explosions from an arms dump sent missiles raining onto their homes killing six members of one family. Locals feared more were trapped under the rubble. The weapons dump was at a nearby US camp. They hold the Americans responsible. So why was there so much ordinance in an area where there was a civilian population? Yes, uh, well the ordinance is where it, we found it. And we found it there uh, from where Saddam Hussein uh, left it. The Iraqis had left some, but the Americans had added more. The burned out site bears testament to how big this dump was, how volatile it still is. America says this detonation was deliberate. Iraqi militia fired an incendiary device onto the site. One US soldier was injured. ...found at the site. It's thought the chemicals might be nerve or blistering agents. But following earlier claims of the discovery of weapons of mass destruction, which proved groundless, the reaction from the Pentagon has been cautious. Samples will be tested outside Iraq before their contents are positively identified. Meanwhile, a key figure in Iraqi negotiations with weapons inspectors before the war has been arrested and handed over to the Americans. General Hussein Mohammed Amin appeared at several news conferences insisting Iraq had no chemical or biological weapons. Once again, we confirm that Iraq is clean of weapons of mass destruction and that all the American and British allegations are mere lies and baseless accusations. While they're still rounding up the old regime, the Americans are trying to get the capital moving again. Barbara Bodine, one of the new civil administrators, telling officials at the former Baghdad mayor's office they're doing everything they can. Our goal is to work with the structure to get the city not just back to where it was, but better. While the Americans have been criticized for not getting to grips quickly enough with the civil administration of this city, they say they are now beginning to make progress. And tomorrow they'll be holding talks with 300 civic leaders here about establishing a new government in Iraq. And for the people, that can't come quickly enough. Tim Rogers, ITV News. Jostling around the Red Cross compound in Basra, all these Iraqis are desperate for help. Among them, we found these three men, all in their 20s, all victims of the savage repression of Saddam Hussein's regime. Abdul Karim's right ear was slashed off when he refused to fight in the invasion of Kuwait. Like his two friends who suffered the same fate, they were all 18 years old when they were mutilated. When Saddam attacked Kuwait, the Iraqi military cut my ears off, Abdul told me. We were tortured because we didn't want to fight. Anwar spent two years in jail after his brutal disfigurement. His identity papers were changed to red, so he became unemployable anywhere in the public sector. All three young men say no woman would ever marry them. Jails like this one in Basra handled thousands of prisoners who defended the regime. Youngsters now play in the execution chamber, where up to four people a time could be hanged. I was shown the lever which operated the scaffold. This book contains a meticulous record of some of the hundreds and hundreds who were detained in this jail during Saddam Hussein's regime. Even at the end when he fell, there were more than 400 people still here. Of them, many were tortured, others died. Yet most of the records of the horrors committed here have now been destroyed. Mark Webster, ITV News, Basra. Gold-plated AK-47s and other items that officials say were all illegally taken out of Iraq, mostly by journalists.
For decades, the Iraqi people have suffered at the hands of a brutal regime, and now, tragically, they are being victimized again. The only charges filed so far are against Benjamin James Johnson, a 27-year-old former Fox News engineer. CNN caught up with him outside his home, but he refused to comment. Officials say he smuggled 12 paintings out of Iraq and about 40 Iraqi bonds, all allegedly taken from one of Uday Hussein's residences. Fox fired Johnson after learning of the charges against him. Information re uncovered during that investigation led to the subsequent recovery of two additional paintings smuggled in the country by members of the media returning from Iraq. One of those paintings was allegedly smuggled out of Iraq by Jules Crittenden, a reporter for the Boston Herald. CNN has learned he will not be charged. In all, officials say there were five airport seizures involving members of the media. If one, two, or five end up, out of 700 who were embedded, to have engaged in filching something they shouldn't have taken, that's just the act of a small number of people. It is their personal ethical standards that have collapsed, but not the standards of journalism. There is also one member of the military being investigated for allegedly trying to send gold-plated AK-47s to an army base in Georgia. None of the items, though, came from Iraq's National Museum, according to officials, and the search continues. It is a case of first working out what was there, um, both in terms of any documentation that may still be in the museum, although I understand some was destroyed. Uh, because of the importance of the collection, there is documentation elsewhere in the world um, that can be used um, as part of the effort to work out what was there. It may take years before those items surface on the black market. Experts say those pieces of art are likely to pass through many different hands before surfacing. Kelly Arena, CNN, Washington. <laughs> At bases across America, the soldiers, sailors and airmen who fought in Iraq are coming home in large numbers. But after a quick military victory, the difficult issue of governing and policing Iraq remains, as the confrontation in Fallujah showed. The Pentagon and the White House are providing few details as to what happened. And even amid the anti-US sentiment in Iraq, in many ways America is a country that is moving on to other issues. Then the president's tax cut package. The plan is the shootings the in Fallujah received little coverage in the U.S. And the defense secretary Donald Rumsfeld, who is touring the Gulf region, is moving fast to change the profile of the American military in the region. Today, he made clear that virtually all U.S. forces will be permanently withdrawn from Saudi Arabia. We have had discussions about our ability now to rearrange our forces in this part of the world and by uh, mutual agreement the aircraft that had been involved will of course now be able to leave. Iraq will have a steady friend in the American people. President Bush is scheduled later this week to board the USS Abraham Lincoln on its return to California. From the carrier he will declare an end to major combat operations in Iraq. Not quite a victory speech but a message that the war is over and that he will now focus on domestic issues. With that speech and with Iraq no longer dominating the headlines here, there are questions about America's long-term commitment to the country. The events in Fallujah may only increase the temptation to disengage as soon as possible. Robert Moore, ITV News, Washington. Renewed anger and anti-American protests on the streets of Fallujah, west of Baghdad. For the second time in two days, American troops have shot and killed Iraqi demonstrators. The Americans again maintained their soldiers had opened fire after shots were fired at them from a crowd outside a command post. Local residents said the victims were unarmed civilians. The shootings have stoked up violent anti-American feeling and underline the difficulties US forces face in maintaining order in Iraq after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein's regime. Here, at least, the Americans are not seen as liberators. This man, of course, sees things differently. Donald Rumsfeld, who directed the American-led operation, made a surprise visit to Iraq. He met the British general in charge of UK forces and said they should be proud of liberating the Iraqi people. When one looks back on this effort, I think and pray, indeed, that what will be significant is that a large number of human beings, intelligent and energetic, uh, have been liberated and that they are 
out from under the heel of a truly brutal, vicious regime. Mr. Rumsfeld is to tell the Iraqi people the Americans will stay only until a stable government is formed. It appears an increasing number of Iraqis will be glad to see them go. Kevin Dunn, ITV News.